Out of the rubble of World War II, two superpowers emerged, the United States and the Soviet Union. With conflicting ideologies and economic systems of capitalism and communism, the two countries strove to spread their ideas and expand their spheres of influence, and to thwart the other's attempts to do the same. The American sphere of influence expanded to include Latin America and Western Europe, and the Soviet Union brought many countries, notably Cuba, under its wing. The Soviets detonated their first atomic bomb in 1949, meaning that both the United States and the Soviet Union had such devastating military power that neither could afford to go to direct war with the other for fear of destroying the world. In 1958, both countries began developing ballistic missiles. This triggered an important arms race. Whoever could first develop the capability to launch nuclear weapons to the other power's homeland will gain a significant advantage in the war. In 1961, President Eisenhower placed nuclear weapons in Turkey. The presence of American ballistic missiles so close to the heart of the Soviet Union gave the United States an advantage in the nuclear arms race. If nuclear war broke out, America would be the first to strike. Meanwhile, the island of Cuba was becoming the perfect soil for a Soviet counterplay. In the years leading up to the crisis, Fulgencio Batista ruled Cuba with an iron fist and struck down all opposition so the Cuban population was forced to accept the guerrilla communist leader, Fidel Castro, as the only alternative to this brutality. The tension between the United States and Cuba stemmed from Castro's promise to create free elections, freedom, and progress for the people of Cuba. As put by John F. Kennedy in an interview with Alexia Zube, Castro has not kept that commitment until the present government of Cuba will allow free and honest elections in our opinion, it cannot claim to represent the majority of the people. That is our dispute with Cuba. Adding to the tension was Cuba's increasing alignment with the USSR, perpetuated by their trade deal of Soviet oil for Cuban sugar. American politicians saw this alignment as a threat to the American sphere of influence in Latin America. In order to prevent Cuba from becoming a jumping off point for communism in the West, Cuban exiles were secretly trained and used in an attempt to overthrow Castro the Bay of Pigs invasion. The invasion attempt was a miserable failure and severely damaged, damaged Kennedy's image. On the other hand, the Soviets related to Cuba's plight and saw the Bay of Pigs as a show of American weakness and an opportunity to repay the United States for the missiles in Turkey. For the Soviets, the placement of ballistic missiles in Cuba would achieve both military and political goals. Evidently, Missiles within 90 miles of the United States placed the Soviet Union on equal footing with their capitalist counterpart in any upcoming military confrontation. In addition, Khrushchev had suffered a number of political setbacks, such as lagging military development and deteriorating relationships with smaller nations like Lebanon and the Congo. He hoped to silence all political fears with a short-term victory like the placement of missiles in Cuba. To accomplish the goal of achieving nuclear parity with the United States, the Soviets used Maskarovka, the practice of hiding the nature, scope, and timing of an operation in order to prevent discovery. Maskarovka is treated as an operational art to be polished by professors of military science and officers who specialize in this area. Utilizing this technique, Khrushchev planned the Cuban operation to be a fait accompli, thinking that by the time the United States discovered the missiles, it would be too late to intervene. However, the United States' extensive intelligence operations in Cuba, run by the CIA, were able to thwart the Soviet effort. As Jack Downing, deputy director of the operations of the CIA, directly after the Cold War, puts it, the problem with secrecy is that eventually the truth will always get out. This happened when his friend and mentor, an undercover ground agent in Cuba, discovered the Sto Soviet missile installation operations and relayed the information to the U.S. government which let the U-2 planes know where to look to take their famous photographs. When these images of the Soviet missiles reached the federal government, the United States had to consider many options. Kennedy formed an executive committee of the National Security Council to help decide on a course of action. Members of Kennedy's cabinet and the committee, known as XCOM, felt that the missiles undeniably compromised safety and advocated for immediately declaring war. However, this course of action was ruled out because of the possibility of Soviet retaliation, either through the seizure of Berlin or direct counterattack if the missiles were operational. The idea of a blockade was proposed by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara 
who felt it would send a serious message while still maintaining their alliances, as well as demonstrating U.S. military power. On October 20, 1962, Kennedy decided to implement the blockade and announced it on TV two days later. First, to halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. On October 22nd, Kennedy sent a letter to Khrushchev reinforcing their commitment to peaceful negotiation and warning him against escalation, stating, the United States is determined that this threat to the security of this hemisphere be removed. I hope that your government will refrain from any action which would widen or deepen this already grave crisis and that we can agree to resume the path of peaceful negotiations. Initially, Khrushchev responded indignantly to the blockade, saying, you, Mr. President, are not declaring a quarantine, but rather are setting forth an ultimatum and threatening that if we do not give in to your demands, you will use force. However, Kennedy did not back down, and on October 26th, the blockade was successful, as Khrushchev wrote to Kennedy, offering the removal of the Cuban missiles in exchange for an end to the quarantine and a promise not to invade Cuba, reaffirming his commitment to peace in the letter. Kennedy immediately accepted. The next day, October 27th, Khrushchev wrote an additional letter to Kennedy. In this letter, he introduced additional negotiative conditions. Most importantly, he demanded the removal of America's missiles in Turkey in return for the Soviets' removal of the missiles in Cuba. After some deliberations, Kennedy agreed to these conditions and the two superpowers reached a compromise that resolved the crisis. Throughout the tense compromise of the conflict, there was a focus on diplomatic action and a stress on communication, exemplified when Kennedy and his cabinet quickly ruled out military action when a U-2 surveillance plan was shot down over Cuba. In the negotiations, both parties recognized the other's viewpoints and desires and worked toward de-escalation. In renowned scholar James A. Nathan's words, the essential challenge of crisis resolution is crafting an acceptable compromise to silence the drumbeat of war. And the diplomatic discussion between America and the Soviet Union achieved just that.